Introduction to Lucinda by Calvin Thomas The German Classics, Volume 4, 1914 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Introduction to Lucinda by Calvin Thomas Professor of Germanic Languages and Literatures Columbia University Frederick Schlegel's Lucinda, published in 1799, was an explosion of youthful radicalism, a rather violent explosion, which still reverberates in the histories of German Romanticism. It is a book about the metaphysics of love and marriage, the emancipation of the flesh, the ecstasies and follies of the enamored state, the nature and the rights of woman, and other such matters of which the world was destined to hear a great deal during the 19th century. Not by accident, but by intention, the little book was shocking, formless, incoherent. A riot of the ego without beginning, middle, or end. Now and then it passed the present limits of the printable in its exploitation of the improper and the unconventional. Yet the book was by no means the wanton freak of the purient imagination. It had a serious purpose, and was believed by its author to present the essentials of a new and beautiful theory of life, art, and religion. The great Schleiermacher, one of the profoundest of German theologians, and an eloquent friend of religion, called Lucinda a, quote, divine book, end quote, and its author a, quote, priest of love and wisdom, end quote. Everything in this work, he declared, is at once human and divine. A magic air of divinity rises from its deep springs, and permeates the whole temple. Today no man in his senses would praise the book in such terms. Yet with all its crudities of style and its aberrations of taste, Lucinda reveals not indeed the whole form and pressure of the epoch that gave it birth, but certain very interesting aspects of it. Then, too, it marks a curious stage in the development of the younger Schlegel, a really profound thinker and one of the notable men of his day. This explains why a considerable portion of the much-discussed book is here presented for the first time in an English dress. The earliest writings of Frederick Schlegel, he was born in 1772, relate to Greek literature, a field which he cultivated with enthusiasm and with ample learning. In particular, he was interested in what his Greek poets and philosophers had to say of the position of women in society, of the tear as the equal and inspiring companions of men, of a more or less refined sexual love, untrammeled by laws and conventions, as the basis of a free, harmonious, and beautiful existence. Among other things, he seems to have been much impressed by Plato's notion that the genus Homo was one before it broke up into male and female, and that sexual attraction is a desire to restore the lost unity. In a very learned essay, On Diotima, published in 1797, Diotima is the woman of whose relation to Socrates we get a glimpse in Plato's Symposium there is much that foreshadows Lucinda. Let two or three sentences suffice. Quote, what is uglier than the overloaded femininity? What is more loathsome than the exaggerated masculinity that rules in our customs, our opinions, and even in our better art? Precisely the tyrannical vehemence of the man, the flabby self-surrender of the woman, is in itself an ugly exaggeration. Only the womanhood that is independent, only the manhood that is gentle, is good and beautiful. End quote. 
In 1796, Frederick Schlegel joined his brother at Jena, where Fichte was then expounding his philosophy. It was a system of radical idealism, teaching that the only reality is the absolute ego, capital E, whose self-assertion thus becomes the fundamental law of the world. The Fichtean system had not yet been fully worked out in its metaphysical bearings, but the strong and engaging personality of its author gave it, for a little while, immense prestige and influence. To Friedrich Schlegel it seemed the gospel of a new era, sort of French revolution in philosophy. Indeed, he proclaimed that the three greatest events of the century were the French Revolution, Fichte's philosophy, and Goethe's Wilhelm Meister. This last, which appeared in 1796, and contained obvious elements of autobiography, together with poems and disquisitions on this and that, was admired by him beyond all measure. He saw in it the exemplar and the program of a wonderful new art, which he proposed to call, quote, romantic poetry, end quote. But gray theory would never have begotten Lucinda. Going to Berlin in 1797, Schlegel made the acquaintance of Dorothea Viet, daughter of Moses Mendelssohn and wife of a Berlin banker. She was nine years his senior. A strong attachment grew up between them, and presently the lady was persuaded to leave her husband and become the paramour of Schlegel. Even after the divorce was obtained, Schlegel refused for some time to be married in church, believing that he had a sort of duty to perform in asserting the rights of passion over the social convention. For several years the pair lived in the wild wedlock before they were regularly married. In 1808 they both joined the Catholic Church, and from that time on nothing more was heard of Frederick Schlegel's radicalism. He came to hold opinions which were, for the most part, the exact opposite of those he had held in his youth. The vociferous friend of individual liberty became a reactionary champion of authority. Of course, he grew ashamed of Lucinda and excluded it from his collected works. Such was the soil in which the naughty book grew. It was an era of lax ideas regarding the marriage tie. Wilhelm Schlegel married a divorced woman who was destined in due time to transfer herself without legal formalities to Schelling. Goethe had set the example by his conscience marriage with Christiane Vupius. It remains only to be said that the most of Friedrich Schlegel's intimates, including his brother Wilhelm, advised against the publication of Lucinda. But here, as in the matter of his marriage, the author felt that he had a duty to perform. It was necessary to declare independence of Mrs. Grundy's tyranny and shock people for their own good. But the reader of today will feel that the worst shortcomings of the book are not its immoralities, but its sins against art. It will be observed that while Lucinda was called by its author a, quote, novel, end quote, it hardly deserves the name. There is no story, no development of a plot. The book consists of disconnected glimpses in the form of letters, disquisitions, rhapsodies, conversations, etc., each with a more or less suggestive heading. Two of these sections, one cannot call them chapters, are omitted in the translation, namely, Allegory of Impudence and Apprenticeship of Manhood. End of Introduction to Lucinda by Calvin Thomas, 1914